As you can see, I'm wearing a TikTok sweatshirt that they sent to me. They didn't ask me to make this video. This just showed up on my porch and I thought it was appropriate to wear during the video. Unfortunately, it's 7,000 degrees in this room and I'm not gonna be able to wear it for the whole video. I just wanted to show it to you guys. Look, I have a TikTok sweatshirt, which means I'm on TikTok. Yes, I'm on TikTok, at Mama Dr. Jones, just like I am here and every other social media platform. So if you have a TikTok and you wanna follow me there, that's better. So this video is gonna be going through some TikToks. Obviously, no shade to any of these people. Don't go give them hate. Okay, I hope you guys are ready. This one is titled Placenta Black Market and has 1.1 million views. Do you guys ever wonder why they cut the placenta away from the baby as soon as it's born, even though it's full of blood? Almost like the baby needed that blood. Well, um, placentas are worth $50,000. So I think you can do the math and, you know, think for yourself as to why they might want to take that away from you as soon as they can. And your baby, you know, because that's their placenta. It was attached to them. Just something to think about. Okay, let's think about it. As I do with all things that I talk about on this channel, I tried to research this a little bit, and it turns out that there are some reports of a black market for placentas in China from 2017. However, I have never heard of this happening in the United States. Let's just kind of pretend like it does for a minute and think about this for ourselves. So the reasoning in this video is they cut the cord and take the placenta away from the baby as soon as possible because they're going to sell it on the black market for $50,000. The placenta doesn't come out with the baby. I can't even reason why early or quick cord clamping would have anything to do with where the placenta is going after it gets out of the uterus because it's still in the uterus almost every time when you clamp and cut the cord, even if you wait a long time. Usually within a couple of minutes to 30 minutes after the cord is clamped and cut, the placenta will deliver. 90% of the time it either goes to pathology or to biohazard for incineration. Occasionally parents will request to keep the placenta. In that case, we will hand it over to them. No sinister activity going on here. We're not selling your placenta on the black market. I don't even think there's a black market for placentas here. But if there is, you can just request to keep yours and sell it yourself. If you can make a buck on your placenta, more power to you. Okay, this one's called Vaginal Color. I, that's just what I saved it as, and it has about 330,000 views. Does your vagina turn green or blue during pregnancy? I know, it's a tricky one. If you said blue, then you'd be correct. Sorry, I don't have any prizes, but that's a great fact to keep in the back of your mind when there's like awkward silences at parties. I don't know. Anyways, many women will get blue vaginas and it's due to varicose veins. I think this happens a lot with misinformation is that it kind of is rooted in some truth and then it goes off the deep end to a non-truth. There is a phenomenon called Chadwick's sign, which is where you have increased blood flow and increased venous congestion in pregnancy due to hormonal and physiologic changes. So that Chadwick's sign, it's the idea that if you look at the cervix of someone who is pregnant, it will have a slightly blue hue. That is uh, extremely subtle or basically impossible to see. I have never not once looked at the cervix and gone, hmm, it's blue, she must be pregnant. It's like a very subtle change. It is definitely not like Smurf blue. She's talking about varicose veins or varicosities, and that certainly is something that increases in pregnancy. They also don't make the vagina blue. So in no world is it correct to say that when you get pregnant and while you are pregnant, your vagina turns blue. It's just not accurate. I think we need a break and we need to watch a funny video. I don't think he's got a future as an OBGYN, but hey. Okay, this one is miscarriage or period, and it has over 1 million views. You know how long your periods are and how heavy or light they are because everyone's different, but you know how it is for you, right? So 
A miscarriage kind of resembles a period in that you have stomach cramps and back cramps, but in a miscarriage, it's a lot worse because your cervix is dilating. So the cramps are going to get progressively worse and you're going to be like, I've never experienced this before. So you're going to know something is wrong. Another thing, the blood in a miscarriage is like a brownish, it's like a coffee ground brown, you know? And in a period, it's going to be like red or like dark red. So you know right away. I really don't like this video at all. My main problem with this isn't that she's bringing awareness to the fact that sometimes you can have early miscarriages that somewhat resemble a period. It's that she's making it sound like anytime your period is abnormal or heavier or more painful, that's a miscarriage. And this is the only two options. Yes, it is accurate that sometimes you can have a very early miscarriage that resembles a period, but maybe is slightly heavier or more painful. I would say the difference in the blood is not true at all, but there's all kinds of things that can cause your period to be different. Most of them are not a miscarriage and most of them are not significantly concerning. I would say anytime you have something going on that's out of the ordinary, if it's not getting better quickly and certainly if it's interfering with your ability to live your normal life, then you just need to call your doctor or advanced practice provider. Don't get on TikTok and decide that okay, this is a miscarriage, because what that's going to do is either lead people to think that they keep having miscarriages when it could be something else, or it's going to make people not seek care for actual problems that they need to get looked at. I can't see a positive effect of presenting the information in that way. So in my notes, I've titled this one Lady Juice, and it has 3.7 million views. I'm gonna teach you how to make your hoo-ha smell and taste amazing. So it's all about the pH. Depending on what you eat, it can taste really bitter, or you can also smell and taste fishy, which is not what you want. You want to taste like a pina colada if you have a boyfriend, or you want one. So let's start with some things that make you taste not so good. Dairy is really yeasty and can cause infections. Red meat makes you taste really salty, which is gross, unless you're into that. Fried food and also sugary food just make you taste like really bitter and kind of sour. You want to stay away from garlic and also unfortunately coffee. It's just so acidic. But if you want him to eat you like a pizza, this is what you want to eat. Pineapple is like the go-to. It's such a good one. Banana, basically any like a uh, naturally sugary fruits. I'm not even really sure where to start with this, but it is true that the things we eat and drink can change the way any kind of bodily secretion smells or tastes, even vaginal secretions. However, the idea that your vaginal secretions should or even could smell or taste like a pina colada is just silly. That's just not accurate. I'm skeptical that eating a lot of any kind of fruit would actually make any huge difference in this at all, but obviously there's not a ton of research funding going to having people eat a boatload of pineapple and have someone else taste or smell their vaginal secretions. And we do know that things you eat and drink can change that. I think my main problem with this whole TikTok is not so much the information being given, but the idea that it needs to be that way. Your bodily secretions just need to be normal for you. A happy vagina doesn't smell like the beachside umbrella drink that you bought on spring break, and nobody should be making you feel like what's normal is actually abnormal or needs to be treated. I think we need another funny one. That is extremely accurate from both patient standpoint and a person who's doing your pap smear standpoint. It's funny and it happens all the time. So if it happens to you in the clinic and you lay down to get your pap smear and your doctor or your provider keeps saying, scoot down. Okay, one more big scoot, another big scoot. It's normal, nobody's thinking twice about it. This video is about breast size and almond milk and it has three plus million views. This is clear that she's just making this as a joke, but I wanted to see if when you searched for what she had searched for, that website actually came up and it does. I think this is a really great lesson in verifying your sources and kind of looking into things before you take information at face value. I looked at the website that she has pulled up in the background of that video and as much as I can tell, it's basically information from someone who has no medical training whatsoever 
talking about a book that they wrote about how to naturally increase the size of your breasts and they're talking about almond milk. I don't know that that's going to work. Um, I guess I also don't know that it's not going to work, but I can't imagine how it works. She talks a little bit about the fats in almond milk and she also talks a little bit about phytoestrogens. The problem with phytoestrogens is that and phytoestrogens are an isoflavin that's included in things like almonds and soy. Lots of different foods have phytoestrogen in them. Once you absorb it into your body, it may have some estrogen-like effects. And it is true that estrogen is one of the key signalers for breast development. The problem with this theory, in my opinion, is that phytoestrogens tend to have what we call a selective estrogen modulation where they don't necessarily act as estrogen increasers throughout the body. So they do bind to estrogen receptors, but as much as we can tell, they have kind of an anti-estrogen effect on the breasts and a positive estrogen effect on the bones and on the uterus. I can't even get from the way that phytoestrogens work to how they would actually help with breast development. It's kind of silly to waste your money on that when there's absolutely no research or medical professional helping to back that up. This one is about boric acid and it has 1.3 million views. What if they say about eating pineapple or drinking pineapple juice? It's a scam, it does not work but this works. It's called boric acid. You can buy these bottles on Amazon for pretty cheap and my gynecologist recommended this product to me and it has changed my life. I swear by this product. Whenever you feel um, something weird going on or um, there's some odor caused by exercise or sex or your period, um, you're just gonna take uh, one of these capsules at night before bedtime, put it in and sleep with it in and you can do that um, for a few nights as needed. And basically what it does is it just kind of like flushes everything out, cleans it out and regulates your pH. You will feel so much healthier and you will smell great. I promise. Boric acid is a medicine that we will sometimes use clinically to treat recurrent bacterial vaginosis or really resistant yeast infections. It's not that she's wrong. I mean, we do sometimes use this for vaginal problems. It's just, it needs to be under the direction of your healthcare provider. It sounds like she's gotten that information from her doctor, but I definitely wouldn't recommend that everybody just be using boric acid as needed to treat anything that they think is just a little bit off. We use this in very specific circumstances. So what's the harm in using it all the time? We don't have any long-term data on using this medication over and over or frequently or just as needed. And irritation, especially with frequent or long period use is really common with boric acid suppositories. It also is really toxic if you ingest it orally. So when someone is using this to help treat recurrent BV and they're under my care, I give them a specific way to use it and how long. And then I also tell them you need to make sure it's kept up in a locked cabinet away from pets, away from children, and nobody's taking it orally by accident. Please don't just use boric acid willy nilly as needed for no specific thing. Talk to your doctor or your advanced practice provider to find out kind of how they use it and what they recommend. In my next TikTok video, we're going to talk about vaginal contraceptive film, breastfeeding your baby when you have adopted them, cervical mucus changes, the plan B pill, all from information that I've seen on TikTok that I've found to be good information. Find to yourself, to each other, to me, in the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time.